the story of Adam and Eve, if you remember last week, I talked about that the pattern of the book of Genesis is generation, degeneration, and regeneration. And this part of the story is definitely part of the degeneration, how we all fell apart, or how humanity fell apart. So what this story is, is fundamentally two things. One is the attempt to explain man's condition, our sinful condition, and how we got here, and what that means. And then secondly, to explain God's actions why God did what he did. Now, what I'm going to do with you is, if you have this paper, I'm going to lead you through this line by line, and as we go through, try to give you some insight to what's being said. As I did some study on this myself and did some prayer about it, there's a few things in here that I never understood before and that just blew me away. And I'm always excited to share those with you. <coughs> so, let's start. Chapter 3. The first sin and its punishment. You can either follow along in your Bible in the translation, or you can follow along with this. Okay? So, now... The serpent, let's stop there. Why was a serpent used here? As opposed to some other animal or some other reptile or something. The reason the serpent is used here is the people of Jerusalem would have been very aware of what the Canaanites believed. The Canaanites believed and they idol worshipped the serpent because the serpent was used as part of their fertility rite. And so it was a false god. So right from the beginning, the author of the story here takes a false god of the Canaanite, Canaanites so that another false god can be knocked down. So the serpent was more crafty than any other animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Why is that significant? It is significant because sin always begins with deception. It is never based upon the truth. And God never said to them, you cannot eat from any tree in the garden. That was a lie. <clears throat> and so what the serpent, the crafty serpent does, is the crafty serpent expands that to make it sound like God's this horrible guy trying to paint God as this bad guy who puts all these beautiful things and doesn't want you to have them, doesn't want you to eat them. And so he says, well, didn't God say to you, you shall not eat from any of the trees? And the woman responds to the serpent and says, corrects him. Oh no, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And then what happens? She expands it to something that God never says in her own head. She distorts it. And sin always involves the distortion of the truth. Nor shall you touch it or you shall die. So the serpent says to the woman, 
you will not die. So what's happening here? The serpent is saying, look, you can trust me. I know as much as God knows. And you won't die. It'll all be okay. You shall not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, this is extremely significant. Because the sin of Adam and Eve is not disobedience. The sin of Adam and Eve is that they want to be God. Who in their right mind wants to be the creature when you can be the creator? Who in their right mind wants to be controlled when you can be the controller? And that's what the serpent is offering to Adam and Eve. The ability to be gods. It is not by chance that, and you know, I don't ever like to put down other religions. It is not by chance that Mormonism is based upon the fact that you can become a god of your own planet. It goes right back to Adam and Eve. That's what the serpent promised, is you can be a god. Now, this whole thing about knowing good and evil, you know, when you read that on the surface and you go, well, wouldn't that be a good thing? If you could just eat from the apple and you knew what was good and what was evil and you had that insight? That's not what he's saying. He's saying you will decide for yourself what is good and evil. And again, this comes down to what sin is about. This comes down to exactly what sin teaches us. You can decide what's right and wrong. You take that power away from God and you give it to yourself. Now, when you think about what's happened in our world and in, in modern psychology, modern psychology is all based upon the fact that you need to decide for yourself what's right and wrong. Whatever it is, you don't have to pay attention to God. Whether it's abortion, whether it's stealing, whether it's lying, whether whatever it is, you don't have to ask God that question. You can decide for yourself what's good and evil. And that's what Adam and Eve are going for here. And this is still the temptation of humanity to take God out of the picture and rely not on God, but on ourselves for knowing what's right and wrong. Knowing what is good and evil. Do you see how this, this line right here, that just sounds like a throwaway line, is not a throwaway line. It, it, it's at the core of it. Who decides what's good and right? Who decides what's good and wrong? If every person decides from themselves, then we are many gods. And we don't have to listen to the commandments. We don't have to listen to what God says. So this is, this is an essential part to understanding this. So from this moment on, what Satan, what the serpent does, is that the serpent throws the whole bloody thing into chaos. Because when you do not have what is ordered and what is right and what is wrong, the opposite of what you're going to have is chaos, which is the best definition of original sin that I can give you. Adam and Eve threw the whole bloody system into chaos. All right? Now, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, <clears throat> Hell yeah. sin is never ugly, it's always appealing. So for the food to look like it was good is very important. 
to this. This is understanding what temptation is. Temptation, you're not tempted to, to do something that doesn't feel good or doesn't look good or whatever it is. And so what it's telling us is that this sin, eating from that tree, was incredibly tempting. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. I find it fascinating that it says her husband. There was no clergy to marry them. So how the Bible came up with that word, I don't know. But it tells us something about how God foresaw the future and what God desired for man and woman. So she gave it to her husband, and he ate. The eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Here you have, for the first time, the introduction of shame. Prior to this, in the Garden of Eden, Prior to this, there was no such thing as shame. Being naked was beautiful. And now being naked is filled with shame. So they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. Doesn't that just sound beautiful? The God was with them. And the man and woman hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. So they, they did not want God to see them. They thought they could hide from God, who was all-knowing. They thought they could hide their sin from God. Let that be a lesson to all of us. We cannot hide our sin from God. He knows us inside and out. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So God said, who in the heck even told you that you were naked? How did you know that? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, this is great stuff right here. <laughs> because most people would say Adam blamed Eve. No. Adam blames God. Look at this. Adam doesn't blame Eve. He says, the woman whom you gave me, you did it. <laughs> you gave me this woman. It's your fault. It's not my fault. It's your fault you gave me this woman. It's like, you know, when you first gave your teenager a car, 